I sent the name of the theme song I'd like to use. I had no idea that there was another one by the same name that would get printed on the back of the program. Never heard of it before. I was talking to someone yesterday, I, I said I was trying to figure out whether it was God or the devil, and they said, uh, please don't say it was the devil, it was my brother-in-law that did it. <laughs> the truth is that the words of the chorus are the right words. That's the only thing that's right about the uh, theme song on the back of your program. We might listen to it through a time or two before the week is over as it is printed here. But I'd like to sing a cappella with a large group. I'd like you to sing the other version, which I'm sure some of you know. We do have it, yeah. I, uh, I think that most of you will pick it up rather quickly, and those of you who know it, please join with me right away. As soon as possible, and... Um, the words of the chorus go something like this. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he hath made known, nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own. But I know whom I have believed. And that when you sing it, you have to say, believe it. That may be one reason why the song got left out of the more recent hymnals. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Ready? I know not why God wonders things to me. Seventh-day Adventists have had any problems with justification by faith alone. But we have all kinds of opinions on the question of sanctification by faith alone. I believe in practice we've given the impression that uh, we believe in sanctification by faith plus works, or sanctification by faith plus effort. Is it sanctification by faith alone, just as much as justification by faith alone? That's our purpose in studying this week. But in order to lead into that, we need to understand this evening the steps by which a person becomes justified, or the steps that a person takes in coming to Christ in the first place. Are you interested? Have you taken them? If you haven't, are you interested? I was in New York City riding the elevator up to the top floor of the Empire State Building. As I uh, 
reached the 66th floor, the elevator door opened, and in walked Howard Hughes. Now, I didn't expect to see him in the elevator in the Empire State Building. I thought he was off in the Caribbean somewhere, hiding. And I didn't want him to know that I recognized him. But I kept looking at him out of the corner of my eye as we went to the top story. We were going to go and have a look at New York City below. Pretty soon he noticed me staring at him, and so he looked at me and he said, Do you know who I am? And I said, I'm not sure, but uh, you're sure handsome. <laughs> I had uh, wanted to uh, buy a new Jaguar, and uh, I had in mind that if I would treat him nice, you know. We got to the top floor, and I made sure that he got out of the elevator first. We went over to the edge, and we looked down to the streets of New York City, far below. As we looked, he turned to me, and he said, uh, I have a proposition I'd like to make you. I said, is that right? What is it? He said, I'd like to give you a million dollars. And I said, I beg your pardon? <laughs> I'd like to give you a million dollars. On two conditions. <clears throat> Number one, you've got to promise me to spend the whole million dollars in one year. Well, now, if I was going to get a million dollars, I would prefer to spread the fun out of longer period of time, but uh, if that was one of the conditions, I was willing. So I said, okay, sir. And he said, the second condition is that wherever you are at the end of the year, you come back and meet me here, and there's no way of getting out of it. You meet me here at the same spot. If you don't, I have some men who will bring you here. And you jump off and go splat on the cement below. I thought for a minute about that proposition. I looked at Howard Hughes, and I said, Hughes, you're ugly. <laughs> I turned around, went back to the elevator, and headed back to the street below thinking of how stupid a man could be to make that kind of proposition. Who would take him up on it? Now that was a parable, if you hadn't caught that already. <laughs> My father came to me one time when I was a boy and he made that same proposition in imagination. And then he followed it with this. He said, I suppose that I am the enemy of every person on this world. And I come to you and I say, I've got a proposition to make. You can do anything you want. You can go anywhere you choose. No rules, regulations. Live it up for 70 years. That's the first condition. You've got to put it all into 70 years. And the second condition is that uh, at the end of the 70 years, you come and go to the lake of fire with me. And my dad said, uh, are you aware how many people take him up on that proposition? Yes. And I got to thinking, which is more stupid? To take 70 years and throw away eternity or to take one year and throw away 70. If I think it would be stupid to take one year, even if I had a million dollars, when I had 70 to live, would it be just as stupid, less stupid, or more stupid to take 70 years and throw it away when I have eternity to live? You follow? It would be as much more stupid as E is bigger than either 1 or 70. 
it would be eternally stupid. And so with a little common sense, a little logic and reason, I say, yes, I'm interested. I'm interested in this plan of salvation. I'm interested in eternal life, perhaps to begin with, on purely uh, personal, selfish motivation. Heaven to win, hell to shun. And by the way, if God cannot reach me any other place, he will reach me right there. Are you aware of that? He'll take us anywhere he can get us. And if my motives are rotten, only God can transform my motives. I can't. So I say, I'm interested in eternal life. My primary focus is not the Lord Jesus. It is to get on on heaven. And gradually I begin to take those steps that every person takes in coming to Christ. Now, if you sit down and read the book, Steps to Christ, you'll discover that uh, the steps are not given in order. In fact, there's a great deal of doubling back and forth. There's no attempt. This rather provoked me at first when I read the book. I said, why don't they organize it? And then someone said, where in the Bible do you find an organized Bible study on the Sabbath question? Nowhere. Where, what chapter in the Bible do you have as an organized Bible study on the state of the dead? Nowhere. You study and you dig it out for yourself. And if you go through the book Steps to Christ, and if you read it backwards and forwards and check it out with the Bible instruction concerning salvation, you'll discover, I believe, that the steps that everyone takes in coming to Christ are these, in this order. Number one, he has a desire for something better. Something better than he's presently experiencing. He may not even identify it as religion. All he knows is that he wants something better than he's presently going through. And so he begins to look for something better. He looks for it in the gutter. He looks for it in uh, flashing lights. He looks for it in drugs or pleasure. He looks for it in fame. He looks for it through money. In fact, I'd like to propose to you tonight that everybody in the world is looking for God. But most of them don't know it. Everybody, that is, except possibly those who have already had a personal confrontation with God and have turned him down. Everybody, the drunk in the gutter, what a place to look for God. But he's looking for something better. Now, uh, there are three great persons in the heavenly country who are constantly involved in creating this desire for something better and trying to move that desire into the realm of the next step. One of them, John 6, 44, No man can come to me except my Father, what? Draw him. The other one, John 12, 32, I, if I be lifted up, will draw, how many? All unto me. And the other one, John 16, when he has come, he will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. This desire for something better is not something we generate. It is something that is produced by God himself. And the devil is constantly trying to sidetrack us off onto some sort of detour, pleasure, money, fame, etc. Well, if we hear the call of the Holy Spirit and do not resist, we will be drawn to the next step. Number two, a knowledge of the plan of salvation, which must include a knowledge of the love 
the kindness, the mercy of God. It is possible to get a knowledge of Scripture. The people in the days of Christ John 5:39 search the scriptures plenty and uh, we used to use that as a key text to prove that you're supposed to search the scriptures you ever used it but Jesus came along and really was rebuking these people some of your more accurate translations you people search the scriptures because you think that in doing that you're going to have eternal life but they are they that testify of me, and you won't come to me that you might have life. It is possible to use searching the scriptures as a convenient escape from seeking Jesus. You know that? It is possible to analyze and dissect and to approach scripture as pure theory and miss out on the whole thing. Will it be going so far as to say um, that the people in the days of Christ were so busy searching the scriptures they did not recognize Jesus when he was here? You can have a pseudo-intellectual approach to scripture today. It isn't worth a dime. In fact, in the process you might even become more steeped in skepticism. No, it must include a knowledge which the Holy Spirit is tremendously interested in bringing of the love of God as revealed in the great plan of salvation. They are they that testify of Jesus. Now, the devil is behind this step. He knows this is an important step and so he'll do everything he can to bend the person off the course onto a detour. And all of his methods boil down to one common denominator. To get people to misunderstand God. To think of God as a cruel tyrant out to get you. To think of God as someone who is trying to see how many people he can keep out of heaven. To think of a God who is busy in the Old Testament destroying men, women, and children, letting the blood run. To think of a God as responsible for tornadoes and earthquakes. Even the insurance company has bit. An act of God. The devil has done a master job of it. And I'd like to suggest to you that we as poor human beings born in a world of sin find it very convenient to blame God for everything that goes wrong. We would like to have an unfriendly God. There are people in schools, on college campuses, who would love to have a God who invented every rule and regulation on a college campus. And so instead of charging the board with it, they charge God with it. The board ought to be willing to take the rap. But it is possible as a student to want God to be responsible for every rule and regulation so that you can end up hating God. Please give me a God that I can hate. That is the cry of the unrenewed heart. Keep him at arm's length. Don't want him around. Now, I don't know all the answers to what happened 4,000 years ago. I don't know all of the answers yet, and I'd like to take some Old Testament studies right here to discover some of the answers that I don't understand yet about the God of the Old Testament. But I'll tell you one thing. I am not going to let the greatest revelation of God 2,000 years ago caused me to forget. Jesus was the greatest single revelation of what God is like. Is that true? And I am accepting the greatest revelation of what God is like. John 14 says it very clearly. Jesus is what God has always been like. Jesus is what God is like tonight, and Jesus is what God will always be like. Do you accept that? The devil knows that you have to have a friendly God in order for people to be interested in becoming acquainted with him, and he knows that becoming acquainted with him is where it's all at. 
And so he is constantly trying to produce an unfriendly God. I was talking to a student one day. He said, I kind of like Jesus. I don't like God. They're the same, my friend. They're the same. They're the same. Well, if you really get a glimpse of God's love as revealed in Jesus Christ at the cross, and you realize that God was right there at the cross with his Son, and if you realize that if a father sees a son suffering, it would be far easier for the father to take the place of the son. So you don't make those kind of questions, you know, if God loved the world so much, why didn't he come himself? Why did he send his son? Sending his son was the harder of the two. But the truth is, his son volunteered too. Don't forget that. If you're a father and you have a son or your daughter and they're in great trouble, you know good and well that you would choose to take their place any day than to watch them suffer, right? And if you get this all together, you realize that God is someone who really does love you. And he's out for your best good. The devil hates that idea. But a realization of the love of God will lead us invariably to the third step. The third step is a spontaneous result of an understanding of the love of God. We call it conviction. John 16 talks about it. Conviction of sin. And I wish you'd notice the issue in this. What is sin all about? Ordinarily, we think of sin in terms of doing bad things. But in John 16, verse 8 and 9, it says the Holy Spirit is going to reprove the world of sin because they believed not on Jesus. Because they didn't trust Jesus. The primary issue in sin is not trusting Jesus. Not believing him. It's the devil who would like to give us the impression that the primary issue of sin is doing bad things. I, uh, I'd like to suggest to you that Eve sinned before she ate the apple. Eating the apple was the result of her sin. She distrusted Jesus. She distrusted God first. And of course, you know how the story went. Eve was walking in the garden. She came near the tree. The serpent was in the tree. And looked out through the leaves of the tree and said, Hi, Eve. Eve was startled, looked into the tree. The serpent said, you're surprised that I uh, know how to talk, aren't you? And Eve says, as a matter of fact, a thought had crossed my mind. And then the serpent came through with his big one. If I, a dumb creature, can eat of the fruit and learn to talk, what do you suppose would happen to you, someone who already knows how to talk, if you ate the fruit? Why, you would become as what? As God. Eve swallowed it. She distrusted God. She believed the serpent. She did not believe God. And at that point, she sinned. Then she ate the apple as a result of her sin. Right? When we come under conviction that we are sinners, this is far different than coming under conviction that we have sinned. The Ten Commandments convicts us that we have sinned, that we have done bad things. Taking a look at God as revealed in Jesus Christ convinces us that we are sinners. Whether we've ever done any bad things or not, that's not the issue. 
We are born in the world of sin. We are born with a sinful nature. It's surprising how few people believe that anymore. We were born sinners. Oh, you say, innocent little baby? Yes. He was born with a desire to kill and steal and lie and cheat and carouse? No. Innocent little baby was born with one common denominator. We're all born in this world. He was born how? Selfish. Self-centered. That's the issue in sin. As far as our sinful nature is concerned. And because of this self-centered nature, it carries with it all of the roots of lying and stealing and cheating and killing and resting. We don't have to take very many key texts to prove it. All we have to do is read Jesus in John the third chapter. Unless you're born again, you can't even see the kingdom of God. If we have to be born again in order to see the kingdom of God, then there is something wrong with our first birth. Right? Something wrong with it. But the glorious truth is that God has never held us accountable for being born sinners. He has never held that against us. Aren't you glad for that? He understands the dilemma in which we were born. And he's very patient with us. The only thing that God holds us responsible for is what we do with the Lord Jesus Christ who came to save sinners. And that's good news. That's good news. So let's nail it down right here, the difference between sin and sins. Please, sin, spelled with a capital S, singular, sin, is living a life independent of Jesus Christ, which because of our birth is a self-centered, selfish life. Sins, plural, are the transgressions of God's law, the results of being born sinners and living a life apart from Christ. Romans 14.23, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And even 1 John 3.4, whosoever committeth sin, shall we say singular, or lives a life apart from God, transgresses also the law, or does sins. For living a life apart from God results in the transgression of the law. Now let me ask you a question. If you or I are having problems with sins, should we work harder on our sins? Hmm? What's our real problem? Over here. Where do we put our effort? If sins are the result of sin, where do we put our effort? Toward the problem or toward the symptoms? You ever tried putting band-aids on cancer? I hope you don't have to treat cancer, but band-aids are not going to do it. You ever tried dealing with your sins? It's a dead-end street. Dead-end street every time. Let's realize why we do what we do. Because of our birth, we find it natural to do wrong. And as long as we continue to live a life apart from Jesus Christ, it is natural for us to do wrong. Well, we come under conviction by the Holy Spirit that we are sinners. And right there, most people begin trying to do something about it, working on their sins, and the devil laughs. The strong person with lots of willpower, the stubborn Dutchman from South Dakota, he tricks himself into thinking that he succeeds on his sins because... He can succeed outwardly, but inside he's still the same. The strong person fools himself into thinking he succeeds outwardly and becomes proud of his outward success, and his outward success counts nothing with God. And the weak person who works on his sins fails and fails and fails and finally becomes discouraged and seriously considers giving up the church. Both of them, dead-end streets. 
And all the time the Holy Spirit is trying to bring us to that next step, the fourth step, which is realizing that we're helpless, helpless to do anything about our problem at all. Jeremiah 13.23 Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? If they can, then you who are accustomed to do evil can do good. Impossible. Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Not one. John 15.5 Without me, ye can do how much? Nothing. That is, we're helpless to do anything at all about our condition apart from Jesus. Not long ago, I was at an academy during the week of prayer, and we tried to talk about the simple steps in coming to Christ, tried to make it plain. We asked them if it was plain, and they said yes. At the close of the week, we passed out blanks of paper. They didn't have to put their names down. We asked them to put down where they felt they were on these steps in coming to Christ. And all of them, except five or six, admitted that they were convinced that they were sinners, but they didn't realize they were helpless to do anything about it. They had been trying to do something about it, fighting their sins. They hadn't even come to Christ yet, but they'd all been baptized. The five or six were obviously those who had surrendered their lives to Christ and spoke to a great extent, of the peace and joy that he had brought. The fourth step to Christ is realizing, admitting that we are absolutely helpless to do anything about it, except the fifth step, give up. Give up. Give up is spelled with an S. You know what the word is? Surrender. It's a word that is not found in the King James Bible, but it's a word that is very popular in Christian usage. Surrender, if we understand it correctly, is not surrender of our sins, which we so often think it is. It is not primarily saying, from now on I'm not going to smoke or drink or dance or listen to rock records or read novels. It isn't standing up in a meeting and saying to myself at some kind of altar call that from now on I'm not going to lose my temper, I'm going to surrender my temper. No. Surrender is of self. And by that, we don't mean stopping taking the biggest piece of pie. We mean giving up on ourselves. Surrender is admitting that we can't do anything about our smoking, drinking, dancing, chewing, carousing, Surrender is admitting that there's not a thing we can do, really, that counts. Admitting that we are helpless. And you'll find this concept of surrender in Romans 9, 30 to 32, and Romans 10, 1 to 4. Problem in the days of Jesus, they did not submit themselves unto the righteousness of God. This is one of the hardest things for us to do, to admit our helplessness. But when we finally do and we give up on ourselves, some people are close to suicide. That's what suicide demands, giving up on yourself. Some people are close to ulcers. Some people are close to never sleeping at night. Some people are close to nervous breakdowns because it's terrible the beating that we'll take before we finally give up on ourselves. The proud heart wants to do something to earn or to merit salvation. The Holy Spirit tenderly, just as fast as possible, draws every one of us to the point where we give up on ourselves. This does not mean that we're worthless. It does mean that we're helpless. And please catch the difference between helplessness and worthlessness. There's a big difference. We are worth the entire universe in the sight of God. One sinner, all heaven rejoices when they commit their lives to Jesus. And the cross proves it, that we're worth everything. 
but we're still helpless to change our lives apart from Jesus. And when we give up, then it is that we can come to Christ. How do we come to Christ when we can't see him? We come to Christ on our knees before his open word. That's the way it's done. And we come with a sense of helplessness, having given up on ourselves. We look up toward heaven and we say, God, there's not a chance in the world that I can ever meet you in your kingdom. There's not a chance in the world that I can be the kind of Christian I want to be. If anything gets done about my life, you're going to have to do it. I can't. And the painful truth is that no one ever comes to Christ until until they reach that point. Desire of Ages, page 300. The Lord can do nothing toward the recovery of man until convinced of his own weakness and stripped of all self-sufficiency, he yields himself to the control of God. Then... He can receive the gift that heaven is waiting to bestow. At that point, and it might be that there's someone here tonight who realizes that you're at that point right now. At that point, you can look up to God and you can say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And you can experience the miracle working power of the new birth, of justification, of conversion. One day there was a poor leper who sat by the side of the road. And as he sat there, he heard news of Jesus down by the lake. Now uh, lepers have not been cleansed since the days of Elisha had been unheard of. But as he heard the story of how Jesus accepted the blind, the lame, sinners, he took courage. And you see the poor leper with parts of his body eaten away. You see him in his rags, heading out toward the lakeside where the crowds of people are thronging around Jesus. They don't see him at first, and he keeps quiet. He's not saying unclean this time. As he comes close to the edge of the crowd, finally someone spots him. And they cry out in horror because he's a terrible sight. They try to get him to leave, but he doesn't leave. He only has one idea in mind. He must get into the presence of Jesus. He keeps coming. As he comes, the crowds fall back. They don't want to be near him. This is exactly what he had in mind. They fall back and they open a path right through to Jesus. And you see them falling back as he goes closer to Jesus. Finally, he comes into the very presence of Jesus. Matthew says he came and beseeched him. Mark says he came and kneeled down to him. Luke says he came and cast himself at Jesus' feet. Can you see him throwing himself on the ground? With these words, Lord, if you will, if you choose to, you can make me clean. And Jesus never hesitated one second. I will. Because Jesus knew that leprosy represented sin. Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. I will. Be thou clean. And that's true tonight. Do you believe it? What a wonderful redemption. Never can a mortal know How my sins, though red like crimson, can be whiter than the snow. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you tonight for the beautiful story, the plan of salvation. We're thankful that though our sins are red like crimson, thou canst cleanse us whiter than the snow. Please accept our plea tonight for thy grace, for the realization of thy power, thy forgiveness. And please help us as we look toward you 
in all of our helplessness to be able to surrender, to give up on ourselves, to come to you just as we are. Thank you for accepting us just as we are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You have been listening to another special American Christian Ministries presentation. This recording has been digitally reprocessed from the original audio cassette or reel-to-reel in order to make this CD available. The audio quality was improved as much as possible. International copyright, American Christian Ministries. All rights reserved. To order a copy of this or other presentations or for a free catalog, please call toll-free 800-233-4450. International calls dial 717-652-7000. You may also order from our secure website at www.americanchristianministries.org. There you will discover the largest selection of authentic Adventist preaching available. If American Christian Ministries has been a blessing to you, why not take a moment just now and send us a note or an email with your testimony. We'll share it with our speakers and volunteer workers to encourage them. Your prayers and continued financial support are very important to ensure the continuation of this ministry as we help prepare America and the world to meet Jesus Christ. Peace coming soon.